Hi everyone, it's great to see so many people here. This is fantastic. The last couple of months we've had no one on campus for a long period of time and it's been very quiet. Um, but now it's great to have a lot of people on campus. Uh, my name is Matt. Um, I'm from the Student Learning Support Service. I'm a lecturer here in Academic Language and Learning. Uh, and today I'm going to talk to you about assignments and grades. Uh, it's going to be a little bit different. Uh, I'm not going to talk for a whole uh, hour about just assignments and grades. I'm going to talk about the university, um, the language we use here, the colleges that we have here. Um, it all feeds into assignments and grades though. Uh, the take home message is, um, I know that you're all uh, thinking very much about assignments and grades at university. It's a big driver uh, when you're here, you want to get uh, good grades, you've got a lot of assignments to do. Um, the important thing to emphasise uh, is that it's a journey. That's the most important thing that I want you to take home today. There are a few seats uh, in the front here and scattered through here if uh, people at the back or still coming in want to fill those in. That's good. We might have some more people coming as well. So come in and find a seat. That's okay. It's perfectly all right to wander around uh, and find seats while, while I'm talking. So before I get into it, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners, uh, the Ghana people uh, of the, the lands and waters that we uh, meet here today uh, and at uh, our Bedford Park campus. And I pay my respects to their elders past and present. So there are five parts to this. Um, the first part, I'll talk to you a little bit very quickly about the Student Learning Support Service. That's where I work. That's a service um, that is available to you something which is very good to be aware of uh, right from the start and to make use of when you can. I'll talk about, thank you, talk about colleges, courses and topics. That's some of the language we use at Flinders. Different learning activities uh, that we have at university, um, like lectures, workshops. I'll talk about um, assessments as well. Uh, what are they? Why do we do them? And grades at Flinders. Okay, so first, the Student Learning Support Service. This is a central um, group, team of academics um, who want to help you with your study. We work in learning broadly, uh, and we have a lot of different things we offer. These are some of those things. EndNote sessions, um, that's not just about uh, EndNote, that's also about referencing, okay, in your assignments. That's a new kind of thing. Uh, which is very important at the university. We can help you understand that. EndNote is a way that you can speed that up if you already know how to reference very well, but we talk to you about referencing as well. The Learning Lounge I'll talk about in a sec. Um, that's a spot uh, in the library that you can come at any day of semester to get some support face-to-face. Um, -face. Studiosity is an online service very similar to the Learning Lounge. We also have a few nice things online. Ready to go, this is our orientation programs, like for example, this session, um, and we have others. Um, the learning toolkit, uh, I'll show you as well, it is a nice way to navigate our study and learning support resources online that you can access in your own time. Importantly, you'll see this little icon here that we like to use, SLSS. That means uh, a resource or um, something that you're attending is from us. If you are using uh, Flow uh, in the learning management system called Moodle, that's, broadly it's called Flow to you, you'll see a little icon like this on your dashboard. If you click through to that, you'll find our Flow site with all of our uh, materials on there. And if you're in Canvas, that's our new learning management system. So we have two this year because we're making a transition. It looks like this. If you click on there, you'll find uh, all of our materials um, to support you in your learning. So I don't think this is going to work. Unfortunately, I had a video there, but this won't work. Um, the learning toolkit, when you go to our site, um, there's a lot of different resources that you can find. They have PDFs, um, they have videos um, and pages with text on them. Um, and we have a little icon there called the, an interactive diagram called the Learning Toolkit. Um, you can find a, a video of this playing around campus. It gives you a bit of an idea for what the Learning Toolkit is. Essentially, it's broken into three parts. I'm sorry, this is pixelated. The first one is preparing, the second one is doing, the third one is progressing. When you click on those links in Flow, um, you'll find a different type of assessment uh, or different bits of information, buttons to click through to find support resources. It has to do with all things um, academic writing, academic numeracy, uh, referencing, things to do also with time management and study strategies, everything like this. Importantly, our learning lounge uh, is in the central library. 
uh, on level two. So uh, this is not the ground level. The ground level is Flinders Connect. If you go one level up, that's the main entrance of the library. You'll see a lot of librarian staff um, and some study spaces. When you go up a level, you'll see some study spaces that look like this. It's a bit quieter up there. Also a lot of books in the background. Uh, between 11 and 2.30 every day of semester, we have two learning advisors there. They'll be wearing a blue jumper and you can just walk in there, say hi, and um, talk to them about study, about a, an assessment you're um, doing and get some support there. Uh, importantly, this support is something that you can all uh, access. It's not, it's not just if you're struggling, it's something that you can go to and, and listen to us and talk to us uh, at any time of semester, no matter what you're studying. So I really encourage you to make use uh, of those um, resources. If you don't have time to see us in uh, person, or even if you do, and you want to have some additional uh, support, Studiosity is something which you can access. Um, it's free for you to access as a student. Um, you can interact with Studiosity 10 times per semester, uh, and they have, uh, it's available 24 seven um, study advice, and you can submit some work um, to the learning advisors that work with Studiosity. They'll have a look through that and give you some pointers as well. So they're very useful. Um, Resources, you're not here by yourself. University study is a very independent thing sometimes, but you don't have to do it completely alone. Okay, I'll talk a little bit now about colleges, courses and topics. What do all these things mean and why are they significant? The university is a place where we all do three things. We all create new knowledge, that's research, okay? We all put knowledge into practice, we're all expert practitioners, and we all learn new knowledge. We're all students for life. I'm a lecturer. Uh, I've been through uh, university over many years, um, graduated from multiple degrees. I still do all these three, and you do all of these three. All of our support staff, administrative staff, professors, students, PhD students, honours students, we all do these three, these three things. So we're all in a very similar boat doing very similar things. There are six colleges at Flinders, and colleges are kind of centres of expertise, okay? Um, that knowledge I was talking about, that can be broken up into many different disciplines. There are many different areas in which you can focus. Uh, and those colleges are business, government and law, education, psychology and social work, humanities, arts and social sciences, medicine and public health, nursing and health sciences, and sciences and engineering. It's very broad. There's a lot of stuff that we do here and they're categorised into these different uh, colleges of expertise. And so each college will have a different kind of a slightly different culture about it. Uh, different uh, experts will be in those um, colleges. They'll be experts, for example, in medicine, experts in engineering, uh, and they will work. They will work there. And you will learn from those academics in those colleges. So they all, uh, all six colleges focus on different areas of knowledge or if you like discipline, discipline areas. Um, your degree that you're enrolled in, this is also called a course, okay? So the degree is also called a course. A course means it's a degree. It's a big program that you do over, for example, three years. Sometimes it only takes one year or two years. Sometimes it takes four or five years. And if you do it part-time, it can take even longer. Your course, importantly, um, is a collection of topics. And so this is a structural thing which might be a little bit different to you. Um, it's not like you start a degree program, you have a, a class or a cohort of people that you do every um, bit of study with, every class together with, all the way toward the end. It's not like that. Uh, a course is simply a collection of topics and you could be studying with anyone from anywhere. They might be studying a degree which is attached to a completely different college to you. Uh, and that's, that's, that's this, topics can come from any college. So in your first year chemistry uh, topic, for example, you might be studying with people who are doing uh, a medical science degree and an, or a nursing degree or an education degree. So the topics are very transferable aspects of your course. Sometimes uh, if you want to change your course midway, you can do that. We have um, very flexible study options. Um, in that case, you would take your topics and see if they can transfer into the next degree program to get credit for that degree. So the makeup of a degree is highly versatile and quite transferable. 
And the analogy is that it's a bit like a patchwork quilt, right? So a degree is the quilt, the whole thing, and you'll make it up with the patches that suit you for your degree, okay? And the patches are the topics. So there are several different types of topics. There are core topics, and there are often core topics when your degree um, requires that you are registered for professional practice. For example, in nursing, you have to be registered with the nursing board. Teaching, you have to be registered with the teaching board. Also engineering, there's a professional registration authority, accreditation authority associated with that. And so there are some topics that you simply must do. For example, all nurses must do the clinical nursing topic in first year. All nurses must do the clinical um, topic in second year, so on and so forth. Um, some degrees and the patchwork quilt that make up of the topics will be set from the very beginning. So with, for example, nursing, you might have to do all the topics that are prescribed for nursing in order to become a nurse. You don't have too much wiggle room. You just have to do that. Um, however, some degrees like Bachelor of Science, Bachelor of Arts, there are a lot of, of others as well, but these ones are quite classic, are completely free. They're almost completely free for you to choose whatever you wanna study. And that can change as you go. Um, but the important thing with these degrees is that you must pick an area or two to focus most of your attention. So that at the end, you can say you're a specialist in one area. You can't just go around studying dramatically different things all the time. You've got to have an area which is an area of expertise. Um, so for example, a major might be half of the quilt has all physics topics, right? Um, you can also have, that's what a major is. So for example, I graduated from a Bachelor of Science and I had a major in chemistry. All of, <laughs> almost all of my examples so far are chemistry and science, sorry. That's my area. So I graduated with that and I had to make sure I picked topics that matched that major, okay? Minors are something else. Um, for example, if you were studying a Bachelor of Arts and you wanted to do a major in history, you have to make sure you pick topics as part of your quilt that have to do with history and you want to minor in philosophy. That means a certain amount of those topics have to be in the field of philosophy. I did a minor in mathematics. The reason why I did a minor in mathematics is because I wanted to leave open the fact that the idea of studying education and becoming a maths teacher. So at the time, I had to make sure I, get a, I got a minor in maths in order to do that. Outside of all of that, things that you have to do and that you have some level of choice with are elective topics. You'll have holes where you can just pick whatever you want to do out of interest or to further what you're already doing. Okay, you already have some understanding of that through um, picking your first um, semester. There are support services at the university. Um, the library is much bigger than you think it is. Um, it's information sciences um, and it's very large. It can help you with all kinds of things and you will be drawing in the library a lot, even digitally. Okay, so they have, you have access to a lot of different um, articles and resources through the library. They can help you with, uh, with what you need there. Flinders Connect, um, that ground level of the um, library building um, can help you with all kinds of things, enrollment, um, administrative, everything like that. There are also health services uh, on campus that you will likely hear about in other sessions today and throughout the week. Um, there's also a GP on campus, which is very convenient. Um, careers and employability, um, another team that can help you think about what you'll do after your degree early. So it's even good to engage sometimes with careers and employability um, support, even from first year. So you can think about different placements that you might do, industry placements, things like this. And there are many more. Of course, I've already said that there's us, Student Learning Support Service, um, for every student. Um, and we're at level two, of course. Um, and I just have a plug here. Um, our field of expertise, so I was talking about those six colleges, we're not in one of those colleges. Our field of expertise is in learning sciences. Okay, so if you want to, um, if you have some, some problems, right, or if you want to supercharge your learning, come speak to us. Okay, so this is the first part. Actually, it's the second part. I talked about SLSS first. This is some of the language that we use. We have colleges, we have services, Degrees and courses, they're the same thing. That's what you get at the end of all of your study. Your study is made up of different topics that you can pass or fail, okay? 
um, when you pass or fail a topic, you don't pass or fail the whole degree. You just pass or fail a small amount that you can either redo or choose something else to study. You can have majors or minor sequences if you have a very flexible degree and you can choose what your major and minor is. You have core topics, which are must studies. Okay, you must study that and you must pass it to get your degree in certain areas and elective topics, which are free choice. Okay, different learning activities. What are the different learning activities at university? There are lectures, tutorials, workshops, laboratories, and online activities. How are they different? Lectures. Lectures are typically, and this is important, a forum where a specialist will share their knowledge with a very large audience. That's the whole point. And this is a lecture format. Uh, it's hard for me to have a discussion with you right now about this because we've got so many people in the room. We've also got a lot of people online watching. It would take a long time for me to talk to each of you, get your ideas uh, and, and progress in that form. This is a lecture format. Um, sometimes lecture-based um, lecture content, that's a specialist talking about what they know to try and convince you of that or, or to teach you some of that so you can think about it yourself in your own time, in your own study time. Some of them are done in live theatres like this. Some of them are online and on web platforms. We actually have this in both. We've got a live and online. Sometimes they're just online. Sometimes they're just live. And there are also short video format as well. So through your learning management system, you might find there are some short videos there where a specialist is talking about what they know. They're all lecture style content. Um, some tips with uh, lectures. Actively listen to the thoughts and ideas. Take notes as you learn new ideas or are challenged. That's the most important thing. It's when you hear those things that the lecturer says that you think, oh, I didn't, hadn't thought of that before. Write a note about that. Write questions to ask tutors and peers. We'll talk about workshops now um, and in tutorials. That's a place where, for example, after this lecture, I would just see probably 10 students in a different format, tutorial or a workshop, and you can, you've got an opportunity to ask questions, to have a bit more of a robust discussion about the things that I've talked about here. Okay, so these are all of the, the things that are good to do during lectures. You can also ask questions during lectures. Um, tutorials and workshops. Like I said, it's an extension, uh, extension to lecture-based content. It's a bit of a more intimate setting where you can discuss thoughts and issues. That's why it's good to note that stuff during the lecture. You get a chance to discuss this in great depth. Practice problems or calculations, depending on what kind of um, study you're doing. Uh, and of course, to, to ask questions of your lecturer or tutor. Um, it's attended by groups of students rather than the whole topic cohort. And it's very focused on your learning journey. That's important. In a lecture format, because there's so many people, it's kind of focused on me, right? It's focused on me and what I can say to you. I'm talking to you as a whole group, but I'm also trying to talk to you as individuals as well. But when you get to the tutorial and workshop, it's focused on you. So be an active participant in that. Come with questions. It's not there for you to absorb things which are said. It's for you to ask questions and be involved in that. Everything you don't know about, or you're thinking about is something new to you, ask questions about that. Try and push your learning a little bit further every time. And of course, be respectful to your peers and teachers when having dialogue. Mm -hmm. People will have different opinions, different views, different past experiences, and they'll come from different cultures and backgrounds. It's important to be respectful to your peers and your, and your teachers. Labs and pracs, these are practical-based exercises. Normally, because the topic you are studying leads to a degree which allows you to be a professional in a certain field. And those fields will have practical based elements. I know I've got a picture here of someone in a lab or a medical setting, but it also applies to many other um, uh, courses and, and styles of study, for example, law, right, and accounting and things like this. There's a lot of practical based learning there as well. You might have specialised workshops um, or laboratories, kind of the same thing where you will start practicing um, what you'll do in the trade, okay? Um, practice the work and skills of a professional. To prepare for this, and these are really valuable opportunities, right? You don't get that many chances during your degree 
to go to a specialised workshop or a laboratory or a practical session, especially when you're working with other people who have been working in that field for a long time. Be prepared for those. Read very widely. You've got to do a lot of reading. Um, you're not going to have someone stand over you and make you read those things. It's very helpful when you read widely. It helps you to think about it and to ask more questions. Be aware of safety procedures and also um, typical field specific rules and things like that before you go in so that they're not a huge barrier to learning other things when you're there. And also study what you've learned in class because that is of course highly relevant to what you'll be doing in practice. Um, remember the point of these is to do the practice, not to do all this core learning you can do by yourself beforehand. Do some of that first, read widely, have all the questions in your head, and then when you go to a practical or a laboratory or a specialised workshop where you can practice the skills, practice the skills. Yes. The question online is, is there a limit to how many people can attend the tutorial? A great question. Um, normally with your topic and you have things like this, you'll have um, a chance at the beginning of the semester to sign up to different tutorial groups, laboratory sessions that are timetabled. They will often have a cap right? Like they don't accept more than 16 to 20 people or something because they don't have enough equipment for more than those people to use, uh, uh, for more than those, that number of people to use, uh, or for a tutorial session, it's got to be an intimate enough discussion. You can't have 40 people go to a single tutorial group or workshop group because then we can't all contribute our ideas and chat, okay? So um, the important thing is to uh, make sure to register with a timetable at a time that suits you. Great question. Um, online activities. There are a lot of online activities these days. Lectures, tutorials and workshops can happen online as well. Okay, so it can happen online through Flow. It can happen asynchronously. That's when uh, online there's an activity to do and you can do it in your own time, right? And then other people will contribute to it in their own time, kind of like a chat, right? a chat. So people don't, not necessarily on the chat at the same time, but they contribute it over time, over a week or two. There's videos and text, interactive content sometimes, and discussion forums online. It's good to contribute to all of these and to read what other people um, add to that as well. Consolidation is probably the most important thing after all of that. The important thing is, is to do some further reading, practice all the things you've learned about, and reflect on how you're going. This basically is consolidation of what you've been learning. This is the stuff that will pay dividends when you get to the end of your topic and you go to the next semester, when you study the next topic in line and it gets more challenging, when you eventually graduate and go into work. Um, this stuff will make the rest of your life really easy, okay? And it will make your exam easier, it will make your assessments easier, doing that consolidation work. Um, the work is done in the journey, not in the assessment so much. Make good use of your own study time because um, you'll have all this time free um, in your calendar, um, but you are full-time students, so make sure to use that time as independent study and being proactive about that and critical about what you spend your time on as well. Excellent. Okay, so the activities at Flinders we've talked about, lectures, tutorials, workshops. So this is a forum like this, a lecture, tutorials, workshops, laboratories, more intimate. Online, practical, flow, also some of you will be on Canvas. Um, collaborate as a platform that's used in Flow, but we won't be using that soon. Um, and consolidation as being very important. The question online was, is there a difference when something is called a seminar in a topic, like a learning activity, not, it's not called a workshop or a tutorial? Um, about those colleges of expertise, some people in certain colleges will call these things a different name, right? So a seminar might actually be a lecture. It depends on where it comes from. A seminar might be a smaller thing. It does depend on the context of who's using those, uh, those words. So um, you can probably get some hints from people closer to the discipline of expertise rather than me about that, but it will mean something along these lines. Sometimes a seminar also means a lecture, but it's a guest coming in giving a lecture. So it's kind of like a special lecture, right? a seminar. And sometimes you can use the word seminar to mean that students will be presenting their work in a seminar. 
okay, an academic thing, right? So it's important that um, these are quite general and generic words and they will mean slightly different things depending on what you're studying. So it's good to ask clarification um, in those um, disciplines, but you can also just sign up um, per the instructions and turn up and see what it's like as well. Sometimes that's the only way to, uh, to do it. Excellent. So I will continue. We're about halfway through. Um, assessments. What are they and why do we do them? Now, I've talked a lot about learning as a journey. Okay, I've talked a lot about the different things at Flinders, the colleges, the degrees, the topics, how that's all organised, how that's structured. And I've talked about learning activities and what's important to do in those learning activities. Assessment is just another learning activity. It's another chance for you to do something, learn from it, but it's also assessed. And this is a really important term, assessment. What is assessment? You might have a lot of different ideas about what assessment means, for example, from your time at school, right? Or from your time at the workplace. Assessment's used in many different ways. People who are coming from school will have done state-based assessments, right? You might have just come from your final year of high school where you've had examinations. I'm not quite sure if you do do examinations now because of uh, everything that's happening, but exams or big assessments that you have, um, sometimes personal project assessments. Um, but it's important to think about this in the right way, okay? Assessments are learning activities and they are, okay, importantly, assessed by your tutor or lecturer. Okay, so it's a learning activity, um, but someone who really knows the stuff will look at that and give you some feedback on how you're going, how your learning journey is progressing, right? It's not a judgment on how good you are or not. It is an assessment of where you are at this time based on that learning activity, that assessment piece. It's not necessarily reflective of really where you are on your learning journey. It's just a best guess. So I've got the image of a measuring tape here. Okay, so it is a measurement. What types of uh, assessments do we have? Essays, reports, presentations, quizzes, examinations, and many other things that will be quite field specific. Like for example, case studies is something that you do in nursing a lot. Okay, so Jeff Masters from the Australian Council for Educational Research. Um, I did a degree with, with ASA and I learned this from Jeff and Jeff um, is a bit of a pioneer in this area. The purpose of assessment is to measure where you are in your learning journey at the time of assessment. And that's very important. It changes as you go. You don't start a degree in engineering as an engineer already. It's something you want to grow over that time. Okay, so you're not expected to be able to do this stuff from the beginning. And along the way, you'll have some bad assessments, right? You'll have some good assessments. But what does that mean? That's just some feedback to take away and to adjust your approach for the future. Okay, so there are different assessments, extended responses. These are essays, reports, presentations. These are things where you're, open, you're asked an open-ended uh, question and you have to give a lot of stuff about it, right? So, for example, writing an essay, you have to write a lot, 1,000 words on it, 1,500 words on it. Report, again, 1,000 words, 1,500 words. Presentation, you have to speak for 10 minutes about something. Um, with these, it's important to read widely and to try and know the stuff as best you can. Think deeply about the question, right? What, what is the question? What is it asking? What are all parts of the question? Because all you have to do is answer the question. You don't have to add anything extra, right? So you can write 1,500 words, but if you haven't addressed part of the question, it's not really the right answer, you see? So think deeply about the assessment task, apply what you've learned, and communicate with detail. This is a detailed response. Short responses like tests and quizzes are different. You'll be asked questions where instead of writing a thousand words, there's less than a sentence that you write or maybe a paragraph that you write, okay? Multiple choice questions uh, obviously is just ticking the box based on what you can see. Uh, and this normally has to do with a focused area of the curriculum. So this is very different. You don't want to answer a question in a quiz or a test with a thousand words when you only need a sentence or a paragraph. So it's important to remember this in terms of trying to generate a good assessment performance. 
What is the question asking? How much time have I got to do this? What length of a response am I asked to produce? And then temper the way you approach it based on that and practice it as well. Practice assessment performance. Examinations are kind of a mix of both of these, right? So normally, if you do an examination, it is a very large portion, or in fact, the whole curriculum, everything you've been learning, and it will have different types of questions depending on your area of study. For example, in, in law, you might have an exam where you do three essays in a three hour period, right? So three extended response questions, probably you would write about 600 words, 700 words for each of those uh, in the three hours. That's a very different style of assessment that you've got to practice how to do. Some other assessments will be all multiple choice. And some of them will be a mixture of multiple choice, short answer responses, and maybe an, like an application question where you have to write a little bit about it. So all this is to say is that when you're assessed, it's based on the piece that you produce. So also try to understand the rules of the game, right? And practice that assessment performance so that that assessment performance can most accurately reflect where you are on your learning journey so you can get the best possible feedback. Okay. Sometimes you have skills and practical based assessments like the laboratory um, laboratories uh, we're talking about before. Sometimes that can be assessed. Someone might assess how, for example, how you're doing this particular skill, right? Especially for clinical purposes. Um, and again, that takes that that makes it that uh, in your learning activities um, leading up to this. That's why it's good to spend some more focus on the actual activity rather than some of the background knowledge that you can learn beforehand. Yep. And we're just getting some air con um, because it's getting a bit warm in here. Um, so uh, with assessments and feedback, what does it tell you? It tells you how much or attempts to tell you how much you've learned so far where you are currently at in your learning journey and what to learn next. This is a picture of a rubric. This is one that I actually prepared and I use for a course that I, a, a topic that I teach. Um, uh, this is one way in which you can get feedback and you will often get feedback in, um, uh, for an assessment. You might not see it so much depending on exactly what you're studying, but a lot of people will see these rubrics. The idea of a, an assessment rubric is that based on your assessment piece, Okay, not you as a person, based on your assessment piece. An assessor will tell you where on the scale, if you can see up the, the top there's zero to four points all the way up to 10, right? Where on the scale you fit, right? So if you get a five out of six for this top criterion, right? Um, it, there's a descriptor there that tells you about what you've generated and what the assessor believes, where they believe you fit now, right? So if you get a five out of 10, that doesn't mean you're a five out of 10 student. It doesn't mean that assessment after assessment, you'll always get five out of 10, right? It means that in order to get to the next step, have a look at this one, what this says, and try and understand why you didn't quite get that one and work on that, okay? And so again, assessment is like a journey and it's just a measuring stick. Okay, assessment at Flinders. We've talked about assessment. I didn't actually mention it, but I should have. Your assessment methods for each topic will appear on the statement of assessment methods. There is a document that you will find in the learning management system, but maybe elsewhere, I'm not quite sure. Anyway, in the learning management system, it will tell you the assessment methods that are happening. It will tell you there's a report, which is 30%. It's, a, it's, it's this. There's an essay, that's 20%. There's an exam, 50%. So you know what's coming right from the very beginning. You can find this out for the topics you're enrolled in now. There's essays, reports, presentations, tests, quizzes, exams, skill-based assessment, practical assessment. Um, there's the curriculum, which is all the things that you're learning, right, in the, in the topic. And importantly, there's feedback. Okay, do we have any questions? Do we have any questions in the room? I will have questions at the end as well. Yes? Not all assessments contribute to your GPA, and I'll chat about that. I'll keep that in mind. Yep. Yeah. Um, 
Yep. So yep. The slides will be available online afterwards. And there, there is also a series of videos that you can access where I talk about the same stuff, but like in only um, six, six minutes for each part instead of in a long winded way. Yes. Um, where do you access the learning management system? Um, it will, there, there is, wow, Mel, what's the best place as a first? Do you know Okta? I think everyone probably has seen Flinders Okta. When you log into Okta, there's a whole bunch of these little tickets that you can access different things. One of them will say FLI on it, Flinders Learning Online, and that's where your topics will be. There's another one called Canvas, and so you might have to go into Canvas. So this year we have two management systems, unfortunately, because we're making a transition. Next year it will only be Canvas, um, but we've got Flow and Canvas. So if you log into Okta, that's where you can find it. And if you have any further problems, there's, uh, there's a support number you can also um, access. Yes. yes, the SAM, the Statement of Assessment Methods, Yes, if you, you will find the statement of assessment methods for the topic that you study, and the topic that you study will either have a site in Canvas or it will have a site in Flow. And you just have to find where it is and then look through all of the links that are there. It should be there near the top somewhere, I think, is, is normally the case. Yes? You mentioned earlier in the start that there was like a careers and employability. Yes. So the question is, like, is that available on the web? Yep, that's available. Do you have an answer for that, Mel? Yeah, so that's also why Oxford, there's a career hub icon. Should we don't just yeah. so online. So the question was the careers and employability service and where to find that. So there's also a chiclet on Okta. So flinders.okta.com or whatever the address is that you guys should all have had access to. And go to Career Hub and on there they've got a lot of online resources. They also have, you can book appointments for career advisors or see the types of events um, that they've got running. They're probably also running events this week, no doubt. So if you look on the orientation planner, uh, you should be able to see some events and, and meet the careers team there. Um, we also have a question here, which is probably one for you, about um, how does it go with resubmitting or redoing assignments you have failed? So, yeah, what, what happens there? Okay, the, yep. So um, this is something which is dealt with at the topic level with your lecturer, tutors, all that kind of stuff. Normally there's a coordinator of the topic. Um, and typically if you fail an assessment, um, you, it depends on the circumstances. So there are some circumstances around this. So it's probably best uh, left to when that, that happens. Um, you will often, if it's a major assessment, be given an opportunity to resubmit that assessment. So you'll be notified, um, you have failed this assessment. If you would like to have another go, like resubmit it, um, you have to indicate that you want to do that within, I think the idea is 48 hours, so two days. You indicate that, and then I think you get like a week to resubmit it. Five, five days, five business days then to provide a resubmission. And you get feedback as well before providing the resubmission. Yeah, you should get a bit of feedback as well. Yes, there, there is an assessment policy that you can... Um, that, that you can read that has some procedures about that, from this policy about that, but also it is something that you can always ask your topic coordinator about. If you do fail a, a, an assessment and you get a notification saying you have, you can come chat to us at Student Learning Support Service um, and or you can email the uh, topic coordinator, but essentially you probably will have to fill out one of those forms and then and then try and resubmit it, um, making some of those corrections that uh, that will get it, you know, get it to a, to a pass level, yeah? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, the question was, if you're sick or you miss something, all of this kind of uh, all of this kind of stuff. There is, um, of course, there are policies and procedures about this, and and there, you know, and that's because we have a lot of students. We've got to have a policy and procedure that people can follow to do that. Um, by and large, there's a lot of flexibility uh, around that. Um, for example, if you do, if you are unwell and you can provide a medical certificate, that always helps, of course. Um, the important thing is to let someone know uh, and to tell them you're unwell, like for your topic coordinator, for at that topic level, tell them you're unwell 
um, and you need to have an extension. Um, some people, um, for example, I have uh, worked with uh, people who are in the military and they have um, they have deployment or training they have to do for national significance, so they have a, um, a different timeline. If you have um, if you have a a, a, he a health issue um, that means that you would like to kind of often have extra time, you can also talk to um, counselling and disability services, and they can help you with an uh, it's called an access plan, um, so that you can give that to your topic coordinator as well, saying I will need to have a bit extra time normally because I have a condition. You don't have to disclose that condition, or whatever. But that's also there. So there's a lot of flexibility about it. Normally, if you want to have an extension do get to your topic coordinator, you know, like two days before, I think there's a policy around the timeline. And I, I don't know it off by heart, but there is a timeline where it's best to get in touch. Contacting someone a few hours before it's due is normally, the assumption is, is that you've had a chance to do it before even that time, right? So um, try and get to that early, yeah. Yes. Yes, uh, and, and the best thing to do is to contact your topic coordinator if it's like on the day. For example, if you have a presentation on the day and you're unwell, let them know. And normally, right, we'll work around that because that's something you can't help. Yeah. And a medical certificate will always, uh, you know, always uh, help with that. I mean, one way you can think about it is it's like in the workplace, it's kind of a similar thing as well, right? If you're not, not well for work, you'd normally get a, um, a medical certificate to show that. Yeah. Um, okay, the question is, uh, is it possible to submit drafts? And that's very much dependent on your teachers, um, whether they'll accept drafts uh, or not. So that's definitely something I would defer to the, the topic level. You can ask even early in the semester, oh, do you accept drafts for this? Um, uh, often it's no, because there's um, often a lot of students. For example, again, I'll use the, the example of nursing. Some first year nursing topics have six or 700 students in it. There's not enough people to have a look at drafts for six or 700 students. One thing you can do, though, is you can come to the learning lounge and talk to someone about your draft or uh, contact Studiosity and talk about your draft. At the learning lounge, and same with Studiosity, we can't go through the drafts with you and help you to make corrections and things like this, but we can give you some pointers on how to approach that situation. Okay, so that's a very individual thing. Often the answer is no, because it just takes too much uh, time for the for the teachers. All right, I'll move on to grades and we'll come back to questions later. I'll ask the question about the GPA and the assessments as well. So at Flinders, there is a grading scale. You'll get grades under this scale for individual assessments and for your whole topic, okay? So here are some of the grade brackets. This is what they're called. It's not A, B, C, D and E. It's higher distinction, uh, greater than or equal to 85% as a raw score. Okay, um, a distinction, 75 to 84% or, you know, under 85%, that's called a distinction. A credit is 65 to 74. Um, these are the grade categories, right, that you get. And when you get uh, an assessment back, you'll get a grade. Of course, that will fall within a bracket, but it's all the assessments for your topic together that will make your topic grade. And when you get a whole of topic grade, that will be converted to a GPA point. Okay, so it's not one assessment that makes the GPA, it's all of your assessments together. When you put them together, it'll give you a GPA point. Okay, now if all of your assessments put together lands you in the bracket of a high distinction, you will get seven points for your GPA. Okay, GPA is grade point average. So the HD is converted to a seven. It doesn't matter if you get 85%, it doesn't matter if you get 100%, you get seven points, right? If all of your assessments together puts you in this bracket, a distinction, you'll get six points, okay? Not six and a half points, depending on how well you did the assessments, you just get six points, okay? Credit is five points. Going down the scale, if you go between 50, so above 50%, less than a credit though, you get a pass. And again, it's all the assessments together, give you a total topic grade of a pass, and you get four points. Now, so it's an out of seven scale, basically. Now, importantly, if you get less than 50% and you do reach a fail grade on your topic, first of all, it's not the end of the world, right? Lots of students fail topics, okay? And assessments. Okay? Obviously, assessments more than topics because you have multiple assessments in a topic. Um, you get a fail grade. If, if that's a core topic, you have to take it again, maybe. Um, if it's a topic 
um, that's an elective, you might have to still take something in its place anyway, because you have to finish a certain number of topics and pass them to get enough study behind you to get the degree. But you will get zero points on your GPA. So it's not the end of the world, but if you can avoid it, try and avoid the fail grade, okay? Because it's not many points at all here, zero. There are other ways. Um, you might do topics where there's a non-graded pass, which means you either pass or fail, and you don't get any points. It doesn't count toward your GPA at all, okay? It's not a counted topic, but you have to pass it, all right? And this is classic for competency-based assessments. You've got to pass this topic, otherwise you can't be a nurse or you can't be a teacher. And you either pass it or you don't, you don't get a grade for it, okay? There are some other important things, and that is withdrawing, okay? So... Before 31st of March, if you don't want to continue with a topic that you've started, you can withdraw and it will be like you never attended. You don't have to pay for it, right? We don't have to take debt for it. You can just cancel it. Be like, no, I've got too much study this semester. I need to pare it back a bit. That's all good. Before that date is the best date to withdraw. If you go past that date, the university writes your name down and says, you're attempting this topic and you get charged for it. Yeah? Yes. You, yes, so the question is about second semester. If you're studying, studying in second semester or for second semester topics, there's a different census date for that semester. It's normally about a month after the start of topics. So 31st of March is about a month after you start these topics now. So every semester there's a new census date. And if you have a program which has a wacky start date, the census date is moved accordingly. Okay? Excellent. No tuition fee, no point score. It doesn't go on your transcript. It's like you never attended. If you go past that and until the 12th of May, you can also withdraw, okay? You will be charged for it, but you won't get zero points like a fail on your academic transcript. So you won't get a fail GPA score, right? It'll be like it didn't happen. Actually, it will go on your academic transcript, I believe, but it will have this WN. That means you had a go at it, but halfway through, you didn't want to do it anymore, which is all good, right? But you will be charged for it because you've already taken some resources, right, in order to go that far. If you miss 12th of May to do this, then if you want to withdraw, it's like just failing, right? Because it's quite far into semester. You can't just go the day before the exam and say, no, nah, I think I'm going to fail the topic. I'm going to withdraw and then not get a fail. Past that date, you've committed to the end, right? So if you withdraw from there, you will get a point score of zero, okay? Same as failing. And the last date of withdrawal is the 16th of, of June. Then you just get a, 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 an F, right? Okay, so GPA is the grade point average. It is the average of all the point scores of all the topics you have ever studied, okay? It's useful for degree transfer and additional study, okay? So, you know, the ATAR is, doesn't matter anymore, right? GPA counts now, okay? So it's like an ATAR, but it's, it's the GPA. And it's simply the average of all of your topic scores. So I've got a few examples to illustrate. This semester you do four topics, let's say, right? Topic A, B, C, and D, you get a credit in each. The grade point average is five. If we want to be technical about it, we add each of these up and we divide by four, the number of topics, the average is five, okay? That's a credit average. If in topic A and topic C, you actually scored a distinction, you get six points, not five. And when you take these four and you work out the average, the average is 5.5, okay? This is a bit higher than the five, all right? If you scored a different pattern, you got a distinction in topic A, a pass in topic B, um, an HD in topic C, and in topic D, you got a credit. So this is not the same scorecard as the previous one, but the average is actually the same, okay? So if, you're comp if you've got two students, they both have a particular GPA, you don't know how many high distinctions and how many passes they've got, okay? So that's, that's how a GPA works. And importantly, if you get a fail at any point, like I said, it's not the end of the world, but it does pull this score down a lot because you don't get any points. Okay, so keep that in mind. The GPA score is useful because after your first degree, you might want to study another degree or halfway through, you might want to transfer to a different one. And 
when you are being considered for a transfer of degree or a postgraduate degree, a degree after your first one, your grade point average will count. And if there's not many spaces to offer, they will compare you on your GPA and the people who get the highest GPA go in as a merit-based process, okay? So um, that's how that works. Okay, um, Carol Dweck um, is a professor of psychology at Stanford University. She has popularised the idea of mindset, growth mindset, you would have heard a lot about. It's very good to read um, Carol's work though because she talks about it from a particular way. It's kind of the, the seminal um, uh, understanding of this and talking about it. She says, and she has said this, grades are a byproduct of engaging deeply and effectively in the learning process. So, like I was saying throughout this whole talk, focus on the journey, not on the end, because it's about the journey, it's not about the end. If you focus on your learning and you're diligent and you take those bits of advice to try and suck the most out of your lectures, suck the most out of your workshops as you can, and then practice and do your best to perform on assessments, the grades will totally look after themselves, right? It's nothing to, to worry about. If your grades are a bit low, if you want to have your grades a bit higher, then that's just you have to think and reflect, how can I try and make this, what's some advice I can take to boost this a bit because I'd like to, because I'd like to move into a different degree. Um, I know many students, but I know one student uh, in particular, he started with a Bachelor of Health Sciences, wanting to study paramedicine, but paramedicine is very difficult to get into and they don't have many spaces and lots of people want to do it. And after his first or second semester, he transferred using his GPA into the paramedicine degree. And he was very diligent in order to get that school in order to, uh, to do that. Was there a question? Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, so GPA, will that so you said that carries out through your whole course. So would yes. By your third year, that includes your first, second, and third year in your GPA. Absolutely. So the GPA continues to grow. Well, not grow. It it, kind of, it changes as you go through your your degree or your course. By the third year, it will be the average of everything, even what you did in first year. Yeah. Um, and on your Flinders transcript, you even have a GPA there that's written for all your studies. Even if you do multiple degrees at Flinders, you'll have a GPA over the whole lot as well. Um, at different universities, they may use a different scoring scale, so you have a different GPA for a different university, right? Yep. Okay, I think this is pretty much it. Okay, we talked about HDs, DNs, CRs, Ps, Fs, non-graded pass, withdraw, not fail. The withdrawal is important in case you think you're a bit overloaded, right, this kind of thing. Census date, important, 31st of March, and the GPA. Are there any questions? Yes. Um, the question is about participation uh, and grades. I forget our policy specifically on that um, as a whole university, but just check. With your statement of assessment methods, it should say where all your grades are obtained from. And something there might be about participation. If there are practical-based assessments, it might say, you know, you have to attend the practical-based assessments in order to pass it because otherwise you're not there and you don't do it. Um, so, yes, that's a topic-level thing. Yep. Any other questions? I know people are eager to move. Yes. Uh, for the whole school, like the whole college. Oh, yeah. The que is, feel free to leave. That's fine. Um, the question was about are there a certain number of people that get an HD and a DN and a, and a credit like it's ranked? No, no. It's up to the topic coordinator and how they teach, but normally, no. If you get an HD, you get an HD. It is theoretically possible for the whole cohort to get a, to get a high distinction. Sorry? No. No, no. It's not a normal distribution. It's not, it's not fitted to a normal distribution. It's what you generate and the quality you generate. Yep. No, the maximum, the maximum GPA you can get is seven. Seven is the maximum GPA, yep. All right, if you have more questions, just come down because I think people are moving on. <laughs>